This happened to me a few years ago when I was 20-something and still into weekend backpacking adventures. That particular summer, a few old pals from high school decided to try something different, an RV trip along the Pacific Coast Highway. Funny enough, none of us had an RV. That's where Dacre comes in. His parents let him borrow theirs on account of the promise that nothing reckless happens. Of course, Dacre didn't hesitate to make that very promise. So, with Dacre at the wheel of the behemoth rig, along with Brietta, Tristan, and myself, Ridley, we set off with our sights set on California's coastal redwoods. The thing about traveling the coast highway is that the best campsites aren't the big roadside RV centers. The real beauty is tucked away in little pullouts nestled within the national forests and state parks. About midway through, we discovered our spot, a breathtaking clearing beside a stream just off the beaten path in Samuel P. Taylor State Park. It felt too good to be true. Spacious, flat, shaded, the ideal spot to chill for a couple of days. It didn't take long to establish a routine. Mornings were for leisurely hiking among the redwoods. Afternoons were filled with a mix of relaxation, naps, and splashing in the chilly stream. Nights were for stories by the campfire, beers, the standard stuff. This one night, though, this one was different. We'd finished dinner, and while everyone else hung by the fire, something just felt... off. It was subtle at first, but this sense of being watched kept gnawing at me. Now, you need to understand... I'm not the type to get spooked easily. Chalk it up to spending so much time alone while hiking solo or something, I have a high tolerance for the occasional nighttime forest sound. But that nagging feeling kept building, this prickly paranoia on the back of my neck. After nearly an hour, I couldn't ignore it anymore. Hey guys, I finally piped up. Anyone else feel like we're being watched? I saw Brietta glance up, her features drawn and a bit hesitant. Daker scoffed. Nah, dude, you're just paranoid. This place is deserted. Even Tristan, ever the chill one of the group, gave me a questioning look. Despite their words, I refused to shake the feeling. Every crackle of a twig, every rustling leaf, made me jump. I'm heading to bed, I announced, standing abruptly. I'd had enough and needed to be in the enclosed space of the RV. The others mumbled agreements already lost in their conversations. Inside the RV, with the curtains drawn, I tried to convince myself I was being silly. After all, there were probably hundreds of perfectly logical explanations for my unease. Wind in the trees, nocturnal animals, that sort of thing. Yet, no matter how I tried to rationalize it, that unshakable sense of wrongness lingered. As I curled up, intending to sleep it off, I heard it. It was a soft scratching sound coming from beneath the RV. My blood ran cold. It was definitely an animal, probably a big one from the sound of it. Was it a mountain lion? I held my breath, the scratching suddenly closer, right under the bedroom window. Then, silence. Relief briefly washed over me until I heard a soft thud right outside the door. In that moment, my mind did something wild. My logical voice told me there was no way it was rational, but this undeniable certainty washed over me. That thud was from something standing upright, something walking like a person. Suddenly, I caught a flicker through the curtainless bathroom window. There, against the moonlight, was a tall, emaciated silhouette. Everything in me went rigid with terror. I had this absurd notion that if I didn't make eye contact, it wouldn't know I was awake. It sounds ridiculous now, but that's what pure terror does to you. The figure didn't linger. A moment later, I heard heavy footsteps retreating into the trees. Still unable to move, I strained my ears against the thumping of my heart. Was it truly gone? After what felt like hours, the only sound came from the relentless pounding of my own pulse. Part of me doubted myself. Maybe I'd misheard something. Maybe I'd dreamt it. Another primal part screamed that what I'd seen was real. Whatever it was, I hadn't been mistaken about one thing. It was dangerous. Suddenly, 
A blood-curdling scream shattered the forest tranquility. Brietta. I scrambled into the driver's seat, throwing the RV into gear. With shaking hands, I slammed down the accelerator. Branches whipped against the side mirrors, headlights illuminating the winding forest trail. That thing from the shadows was out there. Somewhere. Dacre and Tristan stumbled out of the camper looking bewildered and sleep-dazed. Between gasps, I managed to spill my story. The watching, the scratching, the figure I'd seen. I half expected Dacre to brush it off as more paranoia, but his face grew pale when he heard Brietta's scream. From across the clearing, we heard another terrifying wail cut short. Now we all knew. This wasn't my overactive imagination. Get in! I yelled, pushing the gas pedal to the floor. My mind raced with frantic possibilities. Should we head to the highway, try to get a signal, find help? Or would that creature out there wait and ambush us as we left the safety of the trees? Fear had me so knotted up I could barely think straight. Suddenly, Dacre shouted from the back, Brietta's gone! My stomach sank. Even over the engine noise, I could hear Tristan sobbing beside him. My mind filled with terrifying images. Brietta dragged off into the night, helpless beneath the claws and teeth of whatever stalked us. Fueled by pure terror, fueled by grief, I made a split-second decision. Back to the campsite, I snarled, wheeling the RV sharply back towards the clearing. Dacre and Tristan screamed protests, but I knew. Whatever had Brietta was heading directly back to where this had begun. As we burst back into the clearing, bathed in the harsh glare of the floodlights, we saw it. Brietta lay lifeless, her clothes ripped and matted with blood. The creature crouched over her. It was monstrous, skeletal, but with powerful muscles rippling beneath its taut, translucent skin. The face was sunken, gaunt, yet with unnervingly human eyes and jagged, distended teeth. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before, and as it lifted its head and met my gaze, its lips contorting into something terrifyingly close to a grin, I realized this wasn't a predator hunting for food. This was something darker. I put my foot down, slamming the RV straight into the monster. For a fleeting, sickening moment, it was pinned between the vehicle and a redwood tree. But the creature was impossibly strong. It let out a guttural howl and lurched free, leaving a smear of bloody flesh on the bark and a twisted hunk of metal on the RV's crumpled frame. That bought us the second we needed. I roared out of the clearing, leaving our campsite of horrors behind. We didn't even bother packing, only grabbing the keys from the abandoned tents. I drove for hours, my adrenaline-fueled haze only allowing me to follow the curving highway ahead. The headlights painted a tunnel through the darkness, but somehow, I knew that behind us, something even more horrifying lurked. We made it to a sleepy coastal town just as the sky began to lighten. I remember pulling into some anonymous parking lot, slumping in the driver's seat. Tristan cried softly in the back, while Dacre sat unnaturally still, his gaze blank, with utter shock. That's when the emergency siren sounded. We told the police everything, but with each halting word, their expressions shifted from concern to pity, and then something worse. Disbelief. Search parties never found a trace of Brietta or the creature I described. Life after that never really went back to normal. Some nights I close my eyes and see that gaunt face in the window, that inhuman grin. When the wind whispers through the trees, I jolt awake in a cold sweat, certain of one thing. Some creatures aren't born from myths and legends, and neither are true nightmares. This happened to me a long time ago. I guess maybe ten years back now. Me and my buddy Kellen spent most summers fishing, hiking, or camping out somewhere along the Pacific coast. We both grew up on the shores of Southern California, and you'd be hard-pressed to find two guys more in love with the open wilderness. Back then, 
I had an interest in photography. Just messing around, nothing serious. Kellen knew that. So, when he decided to head up the coast and try out a new, secluded stretch of the Olympic National Park in Washington State, he asked me to come along and document the beauty. Naturally, I jumped at the chance. One sunny morning, we packed up my old RV. It was nothing fancy, but it made those cross-country adventures a whole lot more comfortable. It wasn't exactly an off-road beast, but with Kellen behind the wheel, we had faith. After driving north across the Oregon state line, we turned west, venturing away from the paved highway onto a less certain path. The further along those dirt roads we got, the denser the forest became. Massive fir trees towered over the RV on both sides, their thick canopy almost entirely blotting out the sun. An occasional logging road wound off here and there, but we stayed the course on the wider, unpaved track. As much as I loved the woods, my gut was sending off signals telling me we were straying a bit too far from civilization. We eventually did find a place to pull over, barely any wider than the RV itself. There was a tiny creek running nearby, making it about as idyllic of a spot as we could have hoped for. The first day went off without a hitch. We took a short hike down a nearby trail that had seen significantly more foot traffic than our makeshift road in, snapped a few shots at sunset, roasted some hot dogs over a crackling fire, pretty classic first day for one of our trips. It had been so long since we had a summer to indulge in these wilderness escapes, so we savored it. Morning came just as we hoped it would, serene, the air clear and crisp with the faint smell of pine. After a quick breakfast, I grabbed my camera bag and Kellen shouldered his fishing gear. It was time to make good on our adventure. My plan was to wander about, photographing whatever sparked my interest while my buddy tried his luck in the creek. We figured two hours tops before meeting back at the RV for lunch. For quite a while, it was smooth sailing. I found plenty of fascinating fungi to photograph along the banks of the creek. Moss hung low from massive trunks in a dazzling show of nature's handiwork. Even just wandering in aimless loops around our campsite presented captivating visuals. I'd been so caught up, I only vaguely noticed time passing. A glance at my watch jolted me. We'd been apart far longer than anticipated. Concerned about Kellen, I started hollering his name, hoping like hell my voice would carry through the thick trees. No answer. I pushed the unease down and began heading toward the sound of the creek, figuring he must have just lost track of time chasing trout upstream. That's when I saw the first sign something was terribly wrong. I stumbled upon one of Kellen's fishing rods. It lay snagged in some foliage right on the path. My unease blossomed into full-blown dread. He wouldn't just leave his gear behind. Kellen was a bit of a fanatic taking meticulous care of all his outdoor equipment. I called out again, this time adding in a bit about finding his rod. Still nothing. I took a deep breath, trying to keep a level head. Accidents weren't impossible after all. Maybe he fell and banged his head? Sprained an ankle? With those possibilities dancing through my mind, I sprinted in the direction of the creek, praying Kellen had taken an unfortunate spill, but nothing worse. I crashed through the trees, following the familiar gurgle of the running water. It was hard to tell how far I'd gone. Panic and adrenaline pumped through me, distorting my perception of time and distance. And then, there it was. An open stretch of ground lay right on the creek bank, not wide, no more than about fifteen feet across. A few old fishing spots could be made out near the water's edge where trampled grass clung to the muddy earth. It looked like somewhere folks might go to cast a line from time to time. Nothing extraordinary. Nothing. Unless you took in the whole scene. There, splayed amongst the dirt. Bits of fabric. Kellen's neon green t-shirt hung half in and half out of the creek, snagged on a jutting rock. The bottom hem stained a deep, dark red. I recognized the shirt instantly. He'd only packed the one. Just a few feet away, 
trampled into the ground, were Kellen's sunglasses and hat. Scattered about, I could only pick out small items. Bits of metal. Pieces of plastic that may have been part of a pocket knife. And more cloth. Too much cloth. Kellen was gone, and from the looks of things, he hadn't left willingly. I barely felt my knees give way as I staggered back into the undergrowth. Something wasn't right. Nothing felt right about this. Every bit of my being screamed it. No bear, cougar, or other forest-dwelling predator would attack like this. It all seemed planned, methodical even. Something out there, some person, had snatched my friend. But why? This thought sent a fresh wave of sickening fear coursing through me. If they'd gone after Kellen with those intentions, it wouldn't be long before they got wind of me. I had to get out of there. There was a ranger station. I couldn't be all that far from the trailhead. Surely someone could help. Turning blindly, I broke into a desperate run back towards the sound of the creek. It became a guide, a way forward from the horrors I couldn't allow myself to dwell on. My lungs burned, each desperate gasp mingling with sobs threatening to burst. Every twisted root in my path held the potential for me to go face first into the tangled ground. Every snap of a twig sent a fresh stab of panic through me. Then, a sound that wasn't natural. Something big, moving through the brush ahead. A figure stepped out, blocking my path, and my body came to a shuddering halt. He was immense, easily seven feet tall, though hunched over in a posture that would be impossible for most men. His clothes were ragged, patched together in a mismatch of browns and rough denim. An old hunter's cap crowned his head, greasy strands of his dark hair peeking out at odd angles. But that wasn't what registered most immediately. No, it was the weathered leather, stretched, twisted, and formed into a mask covering his entire face. No eyes, no mouth, nothing but warped contours and tanned hide. I couldn't breathe, could barely scream, just stared in abject terror. Suddenly, he lunged. I turned with a strangled cry, legs finally taking action after the initial fear froze me in place. Every sound magnified now, the crunch of damp leaves under my pounding feet, the whistling of my breaths, the distant howl of a dog back toward the road. He followed close behind, the gap never seeming to widen. With some burst of animal energy, I managed to reach the road and scramble into the driver's seat of the RV. He appeared as suddenly as I felt the keys drop from my fingers and clatter behind a pedal. His hulking frame was practically pressed against the window as I tried to fumble for the ignition. Finally, the engine whined to life. Slamming the RV into drive, I stomped the gas, a desperate lurch nearly sending me careening into the dense forest on the other side of the road. That summer ended forever in that single moment. We never found Kellen, or any explanation for what happened in those deep woods. For months, maybe even years after, I refused to speak of it, even to myself. And now I wonder what happened to the leather-masked monstrosity. It couldn't have stayed confined to that wilderness forever. Did it claim more victims? Does it stalk the dark forests, still? It chills me to think about and to wonder if my path will ever cross with those shadowed trees and that towering figure waiting beneath them once again. This happened to me a couple years back. Can't even look at an RV now without wanting to puke. My name's Everett. Back then, me and my wife, Nora... Well, things got kind of rocky. Thought this could fix it, you know? Grand road trip, quality time, stupid idea. Worst part is, the start went exactly as planned. Everett and Nora had chosen to camp up along the Oregon coast. We rented the classic camper van, figured it'd be easy enough to find spots without having to book campgrounds too far in advance. That sense of freedom. It did help get our heads clearer for a while. Then that little town came rolling along. 
Gold Beach. Maybe you've heard of it? Quaint little place. Seemed all sunshine and smiles and tourists. Even found a spot with a great view of the ocean. Just pulled off on some empty back road right along the cliffside. That was our first mistake. Night came. Beautiful sunset. Perfect weather. All set up with some barbecue, wine, the whole deal. Then... I went down the slope near the cliff to relieve myself. Saw it in the twilight. Looked like trash at first. Some white plastic caught in the rocks by the shore. Then it moved. Got a better look and realized it was a person. Now, here's where things go wrong. Did I investigate? Nope. Did I go back, tell my wife, find somewhere populated to park? Nada. My mind jumped right to... Don't need the hassle. We weren't in danger. Dude was stuck down there. Figured a hiker fell, probably injured. Someone would surely check it out in the morning, get those emergency crews or whatever. Went back to our romantic campfire like nothing happened. Even cracked a joke. You wouldn't believe it, babe. There's some litter bug right down there. Something like that. Nora laughed. My gut was twisting, though. The whole night, even though we barely got any sleep because of the waves... Part of me kept straining to hear someone yell for help from below. Finally, sunrise hit. Took a proper look out. Nothing. No person. No plastic bag. Not a damn thing. Even went ahead and scrambled down. Figured maybe the tide took whatever it was. There wasn't even a place a human could have survived a fall down there. Just jagged rocks and cold salt water. That's where the trip fell apart for good. Nora thought I was nuts. Maybe stress made me hallucinate. Maybe it did. Either way, this tension crept in, a whisper of bad luck just waiting to get louder. Then came the car trouble. Just outside town, on some winding forest road, middle of nowhere, the campervan's engine just died. Couldn't restart for the life of me. Had to call a tow truck. Guy didn't roll around until the next afternoon. Took one look under the hood, swore, and explained about some busted part the local shop won't even have in stock for days. Nora and I just drifted apart after that. Got stuck in a motel right along the highway. Nothing to do but wait and fight. Turns out sharing a space that tiny gets old real fast. On the third night, it got heated. Yelling. Insults. All of it. Took a walk to cool off. Found myself just down by the main road. No idea where I was going till I looked up and saw those motel room lights reflected in the windows of a parked station wagon. It sat across the highway, pointed dead at our room. Figured I'd left something inside. Walked closer. That's when I saw him. The silhouette huddled there, framed in that window. Tall, lanky. Skin shining pale in the headlights of passing cars. Couldn't make out any other details, but I didn't want to. Turned. Got away as fast as possible. Back at the motel. Didn't sleep at all. Just sat at the back window, waiting, listening. That shape across the road was still there in the morning, parked as though they hadn't moved an inch all night. We got out of there on that tow truck as soon as the part arrived. Nora barely spoke to me for weeks. Eventually, after more fights and too much silence, we split for good. Maybe we would have anyway. Maybe that camper van was just the catalyst. All I know is, if I hadn't looked away from that guy on the beach, if I hadn't assumed things were simpler than they seemed, maybe he wouldn't have followed us. Because I saw him again after, you know. Sometimes in a crowd, a glimpse of someone tall and too thin in the wrong shadows. Sometimes in the rearview mirror on a dark, empty road. No idea what that thing was, or what it even wanted. Some primal wrongness the cliff spat up when I wasn't looking, I suppose. The ocean keeps its secrets. That's what the postcards say. Maybe better it stayed that way. This happened to me a few years ago, not sure how long exactly, 
time gets slippery in memory, especially after something like that. My buddy Kale and I decided on an RV trip out to Oregon as a bit of a post-college jaunt. Typical stuff. Hiking, campfires, maybe a dip in a crater lake. Neither of us are what you'd call city folk, more rugged country types. It's in the blood, I guess. Anyhow, after picking up the RV, we headed further up into the wilds of Oregon, winding our way towards Crater Lake. We passed through one tiny town after another, names just a flicker on the map. Eventually, we found ourselves somewhere off the beaten path. Perfect spot, Kale figured. Isolated, scenic, all that good stuff. We pulled the RV onto a small dirt road leading into the trees. Tall pines lined the way, sunbeams streaking through their branches. Not your usual postcard perfect vista, but that was how we liked it. After claiming our space by a stream, we went exploring the area. Not too far in, we came across a ramshackle cabin. Didn't look occupied, a good thing. Not that we expected trouble out here. Kale's adventurous streak flared up. Dude, come on, gotta check it out. My usual skepticism kicked in. I don't know, man. Looks off. Ah, don't be a chicken, Noah. You only live once, right? Kale had a way of making sense sound reckless. Against my better judgment, I relented. The cabin was as unnerving inside as it seemed from outside. Rotting wood, an odd musty smell, and enough dust bunnies to choke a woolly mammoth. We were pretty grossed out. One half-collapsed room hinted at whatever incident led to the place being abandoned. My initial unease started edging into full-blown jitters. Okay, seen enough, I said, pushing back into the dying sunlight. Kale followed, grumbling about me being no fun. We chalked it up to another piece of rural living and made our way back to camp. That night, we got settled under a dazzling starlit sky. I can't recall much of our chatter at this point, probably the usual mix of bad jokes and ambitious post-adventure plans. After everything that happened, that normalcy seems impossibly far away. My last clear memory is of the crack of a branch behind me and the feeling of someone watching. Woke up in a cold sweat, heart pounding, disoriented. My first panic check was for Kale, empty sleeping bag. I stumbled from the RV, adrenaline surging. Then I saw it, a smear of blood on the step outside the RV. It couldn't be. That's when I heard it, a ragged yell cut short, fading into the distance. Kale. Terror was in my throat, but instinct forced my feet to follow the chilling sounds. Stumbling deeper into the shadowed woods, my mind desperately searched for clues. A blood trail, footprints, anything. Desperation and the darkness played cruel tricks on my eyesight. A flicker of movement here, a branch shifting there. And then, him. Tall, lean, in worn overalls, his face hidden under a filthy baseball cap. All those stories, dismissed as rural tales, suddenly seemed unbearably real. There was a flash of metal in his hand, a hatchet. My mind supplied the image of that thing buried in Kale's back. His presence wasn't eerie or supernatural. It was the pure brutality of a wild animal, and I was his cornered prey. There was no discussion, no reasoning, just primal terror and the surge to keep breathing. Every instinct within me screamed to run like hell. I turned adrenaline-fueling muscles I didn't know I had, and tore back through the undergrowth, branches slicing my face. I never saw him in pursuit, but his presence haunted those woods, every snap of a twig, every rustle, the heavy tread I prayed was all in my head. When I finally reached a dirt track, collapsing in exhaustion, relief was a distant feeling. This nightmare might not be over yet, a truck passed, hours later. Flag them down? Yes, of course. But some sliver of terror held me back. What if this isn't real help? What if there's more of them out there? Every cell in my body was primed for another attack. So, I kept hidden. Just out of sight. Crazy? Sure. 
but alive, for now. I eventually stumbled onto a highway where some kindly folks heard my crazed tale, or as much as I could manage. No sign of Kale or him was ever found. Police chalked it up to an animal attack on Kale, some drifter incident with me. Convenient, but wrong. It wasn't that neat or safe. They don't know he's still out there, waiting for the next adventurers to cross his path. The cabin stands as a warning, and this story... Well, it's out there now. Do with it what you will. I don't care anymore if folks believe me or not. I lived it. That's my truth. Maybe a warning is all the good those awful events can have. Stay aware, trust your gut, because out there among the stunning vistas, darkness lingers. This happened to me a few years back. Makes me chuckle now, not because of what happened, that still sends shivers down my spine, but because of what a skeptical idiot I was before it. See, I've always prided myself on being practical, down to earth, someone who isn't swayed by ghost stories and creepy campfire tales. Funny how life knocks that arrogance right out of you. My name's Derek, by the way. Mid-thirties, outdoorsy-ish, more a hiking enthusiast than a full-blown survivalist. Back then, I was into this kick of trying RV life after seeing all those folks gushing about it online. Figured it would be a neat way to work remotely and see some different national parks. So, there I was, driving along a scenic state highway in Arizona. Can't say the exact place. Wouldn't want you folks running off getting yourselves into the same mess I did. It was beautiful country, though. Those red rock formations rising out of the desert. The whole Wild West vibe. I'd found a quiet little pull-off with stunning views. Just me in the wilderness. Paradise, as far as I was concerned. That first evening, nothing weird. I cracked open a beer, grilled some dinner, relaxed at the little RV's table. You know those travel brochures that go on about endless starry nights? I was living that cliché, and loving every damn second. I stayed up late, staring out, letting the silence and solitude settle over me. This kind of peace... You only get it way out from civilization. Maybe that's the first mistake I made, believing I was truly alone. Next morning, I woke up, made coffee, the whole cozy RV routine. I decided to do a short hike before getting down to work. There was a trail winding up from the highway, and the view promised to be even better than from the campground. Off I set, feeling adventurous, my backpack light. About half a mile up, Things took a bizarre turn. There it was, smack in the middle of the path. A pile of coyote bones. Now, animals die. It's nature. But this, it was meticulously arranged. Ribs all lined up, the skull staring off down the trail like a little skeletal guardian. No bite marks, no sign of a struggle. It looked like they had just collapsed into this perfect creepy display. My city slicker mind balked. Maybe some weird kid did this, I mumbled to myself, poking it with my hiking stick. That felt... off. I was in the wilderness, middle of nowhere, and someone's bored child is out here building horror movie props? Didn't add up, but, determined not to let this ruin my hike, I pushed it out of mind and moved on. Hours later, back at the RV, I still couldn't shake it. Every crack of a twig, every rustle had me on edge. Was someone watching me? It was stupid, that primal sense of unease, but it wouldn't let go. That night, sleep was restless. Every shadow danced with menace, every whisper of wind carried some imagined threat. And I started hearing something else. Faint, distant scratching. Coming from outside. I froze. It sounded like nails on the RV door. Just as the sound was fading, I gathered the courage to peek out a window. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nerves getting the better of you, Derek. I snorted at myself, but the adrenaline wouldn't go away. 
It wasn't like there were bears this far south, but you hear horror stories. People alone in the woods, never being seen again. What if this was it? This quiet spot would be the perfect place to get rid of some nosy RVer, and no one would have a clue until my rig got found years later. By morning, I was laughing at myself. Of course, there wasn't anyone waiting to eat me. Had to be wind on the branches. Whatever. Yet something had changed. Every noise set me on high alert. I was no longer out for a relaxing getaway. I was in survival mode. That instinct probably saved my life. This happened to me a few years back. Seems like forever ago. It was my usual fall camping trip, something I looked forward to all year long. Every autumn, I load up my RV and go deep into the forests to soak in the solitude. It's just me and nature, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. I'm no survivalist. Far from it, actually. I grew up a city kid with all the modern conveniences, but there's something about unplugging for a week that really resets me. This year, I took my trip to the heart of the Ozarks in Arkansas. This place just sings to me. You've got those rolling hills, crystal clear rivers, and enough dense trees to truly get lost in. It's the getting lost part that keeps me coming back. For me, it's an escape from the constant barrage of life, work, social media, just that gnawing sense of always being connected. In the Ozarks, I become nobody. It's perfect. I parked my RV in a spot beside a winding gravel road. This secluded corner always seems to go untouched, which fits my style. On this first day, after setting up camp, I hit the hiking trails, found this lovely old path twisting alongside a river, so serene. Didn't see another soul out there the whole day. Got back to camp just before nightfall, cooked dinner over the fire, and crashed out early. Honestly, a pretty ordinary day. The type you crave when you've had too much of the real world. That first night, something just felt... off. There were strange noises coming from deeper in the woods, mostly rustling, branches snapping, stuff you expect to hear out there, but my gut gave a twinge. It was persistent, this unease. But being overly cautious? I mean, come on. I wrote it off as the wind picking up and decided to turn in. Maybe tomorrow I'd explore and see if anything had been around my campsite. Next morning, I took that planned scouting mission. Nothing. No tracks or signs of any large animals. So, what was my deal the night before? Paranoia? I shrugged it off and decided to enjoy my coffee by the campfire. I settled with a mug and listened to the morning songs of birds. I'd only have another few days of this serenity before facing the grind again. That's when I saw it. This... thing. A flash of movement way off in the trees. First thought, a big old buck. We weren't in deer season, but these woods. There are all sorts of critters I rarely see back home. Curiosity peaked. I slowly stepped in that direction. It appeared again, then ducked deeper into the forest. At this point, I know this wasn't normal behavior, definitely not deer-like. But again, Ozarks, who knows what lurks here? This nagging feeling told me to walk away, back to camp, lock myself in that RV until it was time to leave. But you see, I'm a stubborn guy. My name's Elkin, by the way, Elkin Wilder. The sensible part of me screamed for retreat, but I'm always up for a challenge. What was the worst that could happen? That thought alone should have stopped me. Instead, I went deeper. I followed, trying to be stealthy. Branches whipped against my face, twigs cracked under my boots. Then it reappeared, but closer this time. It moved hunched over, almost ape-like, but also distinctly human. It vanished as quickly as it came, just a brief glimpse. Something wasn't right. Now there was fear. My breath quickened. Despite the warning bells, I followed. 
dumb, right? It wasn't curiosity anymore, but this compulsive need to know. Like I had to unravel this. Whatever it was, this couldn't be natural. The Ozarks might be wild, but they weren't a zoo. And that shape, so strange, so out of place. This went on for a while, this game of cat and mouse. My heart pounded a frantic drumbeat, but the determination remained. Every glimpse showed... Well, not much. I'd only get a hint of movement like it was deliberately obscuring itself from full view. Now, let me describe this thing the best I can. First off, it was big. Tall and wide. Way bigger than an average man. The way it moved, it had this unsettling fluidity, but rigid too. Almost like it was constantly twitching, adjusting. That shape I first saw low and crouched seemed its default each time that feeling of wrongness would sink in even deeper not just fear but an unease like my primal instinct screamed for safety i'd almost give up then there it'd be again just beyond the trees luring me in i kept thinking i'd get an answer find out what the hell was going on i pushed further and further until that gravel road and my RV were only a distant memory. Then, finally, something I hadn't prepared for. An old trapper's cabin nestled within a clearing. Not that run-down cabin you see in movies. This one looked rough, but lived in. Something told me I wouldn't find friendly neighbors to ask for directions. But the movement, that thing, had disappeared. My legs trembled. Not sure if it was exhaustion or terror. This cabin. Could there be a connection? Had that figure led me here? Was I losing my mind? That's when it hit me. The smells. God, it was foul. Rotting meat, but also something chemical underneath. My stomach lurched. There was that feeling again. An overwhelming sensation of wrong coming from inside that cabin. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. Yet, despite it all, an almost perverse desire pulled me closer. I had to see. Had to know. This compulsion battled with every screaming instinct to bolt the opposite way. Mistake. That was the turning point. Because what started as just wrong turned into horrifying. I'm going to spare you the gory details but what lurked in that cabin was beyond what most folks could even fathom. This ain't a ghost story, no sir. This was raw, visceral evil. It was the figure, standing stock still just within the doorway, bathed in shadow. But something had changed. There were others, twisted, misshapen. I can't even call them human anymore. These things shifted and jerked, yet stayed strangely rigid, each one different, twisted in a unique way, yet sharing this uncanny sameness that froze my blood. And all of them were staring right at me. Then it finally looked. The head of the first figure snapped toward me. There was nothing there where a face should have been. Nothing I could even describe. No way to make sense of it. It let out this... This keening screech, like rusty nails ripping apart metal. I lost it. Everything after that is a blur of scrambling feet and piercing screams. Mine, I'm sure. Those figures were moving, scrambling, not gracefully like before, but in a jarring, jerky way. I never knew how fast I could run. Branches slashed at my arms, mud swallowed my boots. It wasn't enough. That guttural moan grew louder, echoing against the trees. One thing burned through my panic. They were chasing me. The only goal was escape. No destination, just get away. Each ragged gas burned my lungs. My legs threatened to give out. It wasn't that they were particularly fast. The figures, they staggered in this lurching gait. There was something wrong with the way they moved, yet that didn't make them slow. I remember stumbling onto the gravel road, tears blinding me. My RV... If I could reach it just a few more yards, maybe I'd have a chance. But that damned keening wail filled my ears. They were closing in. I risked a glance back, 
They hadn't stopped, hadn't slowed. That same unnatural rigidity seemed to propel them forward. In that panicked, split second, my foot caught a hidden root. I sprawled hard onto the rough gravel, hands scraping raw. Just before the darkness claimed me, I managed to snatch a final glance. And all those twisted figures were at the edge of the tree line, watching. That stillness again, their unnatural shapes stark against the foliage. It felt intentional, predatory. They didn't even attempt to attack as I lay there. Something held them back. I don't know how long I was out. Came to dazed, the sun starting its descent. Pain bloomed across my entire body, and when I tried to stand, a wave of nausea swept over me. Broken ankle, probably. And there they were, back in the same position, unmoving. It was as if they never blinked, those empty spaces where faces should be fixated on my position. Night fell, an agonizing stretch of time where survival hinged on pure desperation. It didn't look like they could or would cross out from under the trees. I realized if I crawled, crawled painfully on my belly, toward my RV, the line of sight could break momentarily. It was a sliver of hope, insane as it sounded. And as the sliver remained stubbornly unbroken, I began to believe. They couldn't follow if they couldn't see me. Maybe in those shadows, beneath those trees, something else held them back. With every agonizing twist of my body, that damned moaning chorus never changed in volume. Yet, the camper drew closer. Closer. Until finally, my outstretched fingers scraped the metal door handle. Somehow in my fumbling, the door opened. I hauled myself inside, slamming and locking it behind me with barely a second to spare. Even within the safety of the camper, the moaning reverberated. That's when I heard it. Clawing. Scratching. It was all over the camper's thin sheet metal. Something pounded frantically against the windows. But with dawn, even the scratching finally ceased. Silence. I didn't move. Didn't check until long after the sun was back in the sky. Finally, my shaking hands grasped the steering wheel. My fractured ankle pulsed in protest, but gritting my teeth, I slammed the RV into gear. I barely dared look in the rearview mirror as I left that gravel road behind. Those woods might hold countless unseen horrors, but those figures never chased me again. Years have passed. Still, on particularly silent nights, when the wind whispers through the trees just so, I swear, swear I can hear that low, eerie moaning, that unnatural call. Every time it sends a prickle of ice down my spine, they never caught me. I got lucky. Maybe others haven't. All I know is that whatever dwells in those Ozark woods, it isn't what you'd expect. It's worse. They say ignorance is bliss. Sometimes curiosity bears a terrible price. I still try to forget the unnatural way they moved, the hollow spaces where their faces should be. It'll haunt me as long as I live. It was an odyssey into the depths of pure fright, an experience that redefined the very notion of terror. For within those shadowy woods, in that isolated realm, the human capacity for unimaginable evil took form. Some monsters lurk in the whispers of legends, others exist in the harsh light of day. I faced the latter, and it forever changed me. My yearly camping trips never went beyond the local campgrounds after that. I have no explanation for those creatures, not one that makes any sort of rational sense. Were they failed experiments? Some dark cults, victims? Who knows? But in those moments I felt hunted. Not just stalked, but watched meticulously, like a specimen. It gnaws at me to this day. Did that thing, the first one, deliberately draw me deeper, lead me to the cabin? I reported what I saw. Of course, the police thought I was crazy. I spun some tale of a drug-fueled hallucination, but they didn't fully buy it. The look in their eyes said enough. 
Maybe a few searched out there deep in the woods. Did they ever find that old cabin? If so, they kept it well hidden. There's no article, no missing person report, nothing that might explain it all. The official silence tells its own story. Either that, or the figures dealt with anyone who got too close to the truth. This might be my last chance to share this story. They say I have cancer. It's spread pretty badly. Maybe this is a kind of confession before I go quietly. Or maybe someone with the means, the drive, will read this and decide for themselves. Just remember, sometimes it's better to leave certain mysteries untouched. To walk away while you still can. This happened to me a few years back, during one of my regular solo ventures. See, I'm into long-distance backpacking. The more isolated, the better. It's about that push, finding some inner strength as much as it is about scenic routes. My name's Thaddeus, but everyone calls me Thad. This trip's goal, the Appalachian Trail, deep into the lush forests of northern Georgia. Had some decent weather reports, good enough to last five days or so. Now... You should know my style. Less about pre-planning, more about just winging it, finding a trailhead and hitting the ground running. That spontaneity led me to this off-the-beaten-path trail deep in the heart of the Chattahoochee Forest. Not much info available online, but damn if it didn't look perfect. That first day was pretty damn exhilarating. Steep ascents, dense undergrowth, it had everything I craved. But by evening, with a decent campsite located, fatigue hit hard. You don't realize how those little moments of adrenaline stack up. One minute you're setting up the tent, the next your flashlight's beam catches this thing. Movement, maybe 200 feet away, right on the edge of the tree line. My heart kicks up a notch. Big cat? That'd explain the stealth. What happens next, I still struggle to believe. It steps forward just slightly, giving me a partial profile against the dusk light. Tall, lanky, definitely not a bear or anything normal. Then it just vanishes into the brush. My brain plays tricks. Shadows of branches must have done it. The sense of unease remains, but after a good night's sleep, it feels like a strange, half-remembered dream. Day two starts off strong, and that initial weirdness fades. My usual pace is faster here. Maybe that initial unease had some residual influence on my subconscious. This trail, it winds, a lot, turns back on itself. My sense of direction, usually excellent, starts feeling off. But who cares when this kind of natural beauty surrounds you? I even joke out loud that if I keep walking in circles, that's just more time with these ancient trees. By third day in, that joke doesn't feel so funny anymore. It's subtle at first. Feeling eyes on me, an odd sense of deja vu with certain trail markers. But that nagging voice tells me it's my overactive imagination. When you do solo hikes, the mind finds weird little ways to entertain itself. Or maybe those woods get to you like that after a while. Then the clearing happened. Now, there was absolutely no indication that I'd come across this spot before. This was new territory. My route was meticulously outlined for just this scenario. No way should I have arrived back here, a wide, flat space ringed by towering pines. Yet, it felt so unsettlingly familiar. And at the far end, nestled right where the trail led back into the woods, was a structure. Not your run-of-the-mill hiker's shelter, Something older, a simple cabin. My curiosity overpowers any lingering caution. It turns out to be unlocked. The inside has this untouched quality, yet not abandoned. There are supplies, but dusty. Old newspapers with yellowed pages litter a side table. What pulls my focus, though, is this map tacked to the peeling wall. It's ancient, detailing these very woods but some hand-drawn markings, scribbled arrows and notes. I feel the hairs on my neck stand on end. They trace a route that matches, almost exactly, 
my own haphazard wanderings through this dense forest. Now, alarm bells are blaring full force. This place, there's intention in that map. The cabin wasn't just discovered, it was sought out. My exit is quick, almost a scramble back into the sunlight. That familiar path unfurls into the pines, a mocking sign of normalcy compared to what lurked inside. That evening, it wasn't just the setting sun giving me an uneasy feeling. This was when I found it. That same damn lanky silhouette, stalking me just ahead, moving parallel to the trail, mirroring my every step. At least now there was clear sight of the thing, Long legs, almost unnaturally so, with this hunched gait. Then, for a chilling moment, it turns its head slightly in my direction. That face, if you can call it that. Like a smooth, featureless egg laid atop its shoulders. No eyes, no mouth. Nothing recognizable. Every cell in my body screamed to run, but some morbid fascination held me rooted. Then it was gone again dissolving back into the dense undergrowth. By dawn, I'd packed camp at a speed bordering on manic. There was nowhere to go but ahead, back down the trail that had led me into this mess. But by midday, it felt like every turn brought nothing new. My footsteps echoed against the same giants I'd been passing for days. I finally broke, yelling, probably more to convince myself I wasn't just insane. At least there was an answer, sort of. An odd sound, coming from up ahead. Like nails against wood. Only a slow, deliberate scratch. That damn cabin loomed up again. There, on the dusty porch, was some fresh movement. That hunched form. Only... something in its arms. My brain scrambled. Was it holding another person? No. The size was wrong. Almost childlike. There was something shiny, catching the sunlight as it swayed slightly in that creature's grip. My blood ran cold. A deer antler, and hanging just beneath. A torn scrap of blue nylon that matched the exact shade of my jacket. No question, it had caught my scent. The creature had tracked me for miles. My mind races back to that dusty map in the cabin. Was I simply its newest addition? A specimen to be tracked, hunted... Who knows what twisted fate awaited me within those walls. That's my turning point. No way I was facing whatever waited inside that cabin. Instead, there was the dense forest, and with primal determination, I dove in. Every sense was on overload, every snapping twig a predator behind me. My legs burn, lungs aching, but fear propels me faster than I've ever moved. After what feels like a lifetime... A shimmer of pale road breaks through the green gloom. Never has civilization looked so damn sweet. Stumbling to the edge of that asphalt, hitching a ride with a wide-eyed truck driver, my only words were, Please, just keep driving. Now some folks have theories about backwoods cults, or government experiments gone wrong. Me? I don't know what that thing was. What sick obsession drew it to that damn cabin in the woods? I just know my return route from there was deliberately vague. No one would believe me if I tried to explain the unmarked trails. There's a reason there was no trace of that place ever existing. Those old Appalachian woods might hide beauty, but they also hold dark secrets best left undisturbed. I still hike, but these days, I choose well-charted routes, those paths less likely to turn on you when you least expect it. This happened to me a couple of years back. Now, here's the thing about me, Thad, by the way. I'm one of those preparedness guys. Self-sufficiency, living off the land, not full-on doomsday cult, but hey, a little planning never hurt anyone. That's how I found myself out in the wilderness, far-flung corner of the Olympic National Forest, testing my skills with a minimalist camping setup. I figured what better proving ground than those ancient mountains and rugged landscapes, right? It started well enough. First night, I managed to snag a couple of trout from a stream and made a passable fire without too much trouble. Sure, 
There were some sounds at night, branches breaking, the distant call of some animal I didn't recognize. But hey, you expect that in the woods. The real trouble began on the second day. That's when I stumbled onto the signs of another camp. Not an official site with marked trails, but deeper in. There was evidence of someone. An old campfire. Half-hidden shelters built from deadfall. And a lot of stripped bones littering the ground. They seemed old. No scavengers had messed with them. My survivalist brain switched into high gear. The setup didn't seem temporary. Something had been living there for a hell of a long time. This wasn't just another camper. A wave of unease swept over me. There's the wilderness you expect, and the kind that feels... wrong. Back at my own meager camp, I tried to convince myself that perhaps it was a poacher hideout, or something equally explainable. But with every rustling wind in the trees, every snap of a twig echoing eerily through the valley, that gut feeling intensified. I'd stumbled onto someone's territory. By morning, any attempt at rationalization had fizzled away. All my senses were in overdrive, that instinctive part of my brain kicking in and shouting that someone, or something, was watching me from the dark edges of the trees. When I saw a crude spear jammed into the earth near my meager campfire, it was a breaking point. No note, no threat, just a clear mark that I'd been discovered. With trembling hands, I packed up what little gear I had, a knot of dread growing in my stomach. As I hiked out, there was this persistent prickling sensation at the back of my neck. Not once did I ever see him, though that didn't mean he wasn't there. It would have been easier to write myself off as crazy, overreacting to some strange hiker or recluse messing with me. But that gnawing terror was like nothing I'd ever felt. Then, as I approached a road, I saw it. The body of an animal, mangled and barely recognizable, and not by any predator I knew. Then, the smell of it, acrid and coppery, the stink of iron clinging to the air. That's when I knew the stories whispered of that area might not be mere local lore after all. The locals mentioned disappearances, the odd hunter or hiker simply vanishing. That feeling in the deepest shadows of those forests didn't feel human. The rational side of me wants to think that maybe, just maybe, these disappearances were the acts of a disturbed individual pushed too far living in isolation. But I was there. I felt that presence, that unnatural weight hanging in the air. No human is made for that type of wilderness. A park ranger I encountered looked startled by my disheveled, sweaty appearance as I emerged from the tree line. When I asked about recent disappearances, a strange look flashed across his weathered face for a heartbeat. Before he told me it was nothing to worry about, son, that these woods had always been unforgiving. Later, after a shower and a night in a cheap motel, I tried to search for news reports, anything that matched what I'd seen. Not a trace. I considered returning, perhaps with a camera, or better yet, some company. The smarter man in me knows better. There are some secrets we aren't meant to unlock. A month after the ordeal, I still couldn't completely shake that sensation I'd been stalked. Was it a hermit who resented my intrusion? Did some twisted individual take pleasure in preying on unsuspecting victims? Or was I foolish enough to venture into that isolated land just as some folks from an earlier time claimed? Land where old, hungry things waited their only company the bones of their unwitting sacrifices. It doesn't take monsters with claws and fangs for pure terror to take hold. The worst predators in this world wear plain clothes, or perhaps no clothes at all. This happened to me a few years back. At the time, I worked a soul-sucking corporate job with hours that left me little time for actual life. Sarah, my wife, convinced me I needed a vacation. I didn't agree. What were a few days away going to change? Still, after much nagging, I grudgingly put in for time off. Our travel options with such short notice were limited. Flights anywhere fun were exorbitant. 
but a couple named Blake and Amelia on an RV rental site were practically giving theirs away on short notice. I'd never driven that big of a vehicle, but it seemed easy enough. Sarah booked it before I could object further. Maybe some fresh air and time outdoors would be what I needed after all. Our destination was decided for us, too. Blake and Amelia suggested Sequoia National Park in California. They offered glowing references, stunning trails, towering trees, the whole bit. And the idea of spending time near those gargantuan sequoias did pique my interest. It promised to be something unique. I'm Evan, by the way. We picked up the RV on a scorching summer afternoon. Inside was nicer than I expected, all cozy and well-stocked. After a crash course from Blake on operation, we were hesitantly on our way. Sarah drove first. That alone took some edge off my tension. Sequoia was amazing. I admit, seeing those ancient, massive trees brought something close to awe. We spent two days wandering trails, losing signal on our phones, cooking dinners outdoors on the little campsite stove. There was laughter. That felt weird. We were happy. Or at least as close to it as I'd been in years. I started to understand what Sarah meant about finding myself again. My corporate worries slowly drifted away. Day three. That's when things turned. We'd tackled a strenuous hike early returning to the campsite exhausted. I took over the wheel for the short trip to our next site while Sarah made lunch. About halfway there, I noticed a truck pulled off behind a grove of trees, maybe a quarter mile down the road. Nothing weird, right? People stop. But in the rearview mirror, I saw someone step out from behind those trees. Tall guy, thin, binoculars in his hands. At first, I thought he was a bird watcher. Then it hit me. Sarah was making sandwiches in the back. He couldn't see her. My gut twisted. Something wasn't right. Evan, the view up here is beautiful. Pull over, Sarah called out. My foot hesitated over the gas. That guy didn't feel like a bird watcher. Not the way he moved. Not the way he held the binoculars. I didn't answer Sarah, just pushed down harder on the accelerator. It wasn't much but I was glad the RV had some pickup. My hands clenched the wheel tight. Evan? Why aren't you... Oh, God! Sarah had spotted him, too, in the side mirror. Panic set in. A mile past our turn, there was a small rest area. I skidded into it, my heart pounding against my ribs. We slammed the doors shut, locking them in a single motion. Sarah huddled up against me and we could feel rather than see his truck rumble past. He didn't stop. We stayed there, breathless, for what felt like hours. He wasn't after us, I told myself. Just a coincidence. He wasn't coming back, but my mouth was dry with fear. That night, Sarah and I barely slept. Every creak of the RV, every rustling branch, put us on edge. I wished I'd brought a gun or learned hand-to-hand -hand combat. Hell, anything to feel something less than helpless. Sarah kept asking if we should head home, and a voice told me she was right. Yet a stubborn defiance, and the guilt of ruining her longed-for getaway, kept me from agreeing. Next morning, everything was unnaturally still. The air buzzed with wrongness. I had this sick feeling in my gut a certainty that he was out there, watching us, just waiting. I finally agreed to drive, my grip on the steering wheel so tight my knuckles went white. At the first ranger station we burst in, desperate to report what happened. Their faces were a strange mix of confusion and pity. You see folks disappear. Happens every year, the older ranger said with a resigned sigh. People... Sometimes they want to start fresh elsewhere, or they think they can live off the land with no plan. Some accidents out there, too. Terrain gets rough. But we saw... Sarah tried to argue, then trailed off. Of course, they wouldn't believe us. It sounded crazy. And frankly, I was starting to have my doubts about how real yesterday even was. 
stress can play tricks on the mind, 